So you've got me instead of your coffee break, which sounds like a nightmare that I'm not going to live up to, so I'm sorry about that. Um, so today I'm here to talk to you about the development of a pilot Lynch uh, syndrome registry for research. Uh, so as John said, I'm at um, Imperial College London, where I head the Cancer Screening and Prevention Research Group. Um, and our funding uh, comes mainly from Fortitude and Cancer Research UK for this work that we obviously couldn't do this work without them. Um, so at Imperial, my group's based at St Mary's Hospital, and for those of you that don't know, this was the hospital where penicillin was discovered, uh, perhaps less savoury, it's where heroin was first synthesised, um, and it's also where William and Kate had their baby. I'll leave you to decide which we're most proud of. Um, so a little bit of introduction about um, what I'm going to talk to you about today is we knew a long time ago that there were guidelines for Lynch syndrome care. Um, they were in place, but we knew they weren't being used well and patients' care was very variable around the country according to where patients lived. Um, so we knew that there was this variation in access, timeliness of checkups, um, and we knew that there was missed opportunities for early diagnosis for cancers. There's been a lot of work done since this, um, and, but it's been recognised that we really need a national registry of Lynch syndrome patients to enable us to come up with the best nationally coordinated care for these patients, um, and also to increase awareness um, and ensure that people received timely care um, and appropriate care, regardless of where they live. Um, and so you heard a bit this morning from Fiona about having a, a national registry, and that's really important so that we can understand exactly what's happening all around the country, whether it be England, or England, Wales, Scotland, Ireland. Um, it, that's really, really important. But it's quite difficult to have a registry of everyone that we can track with Lynch syndrome and do research on those people with consent. So in order to have everyone's individual data from the hospitals, from their colonoscopy surveillance, for example, we need to have consent. So we need to approach these patients and say, can we hold your data? Can we collect more data? And so on a national level, that's quite difficult. So that's our starting place. And so we wanted to come up with what we're calling a pilot Lynch syndrome registry. And it doesn't mean this kind of pilot. A pilot just means like a smaller scale version. Um, in which we can conduct research and, and that allows us to contact the patients to say, hey, we've got this new study, do you want to be part of it? And of course, on a national scale, everyone with Lynch syndrome wouldn't, you know, not everybody is going to want to be approached for things like that. So the approach that we took was, first of all, to get straight on the phone to John and Jill, um, because we already knew that they had got people interested in research or Lynch syndrome patients interested in uh, research through, through CAP2, CAP3. Um, and so we thought that was a great starting point and why reinvent the wheel. Um, and so we wanted people with Lynch syndrome, we wanted people over 18 uh, to start with living in England. And I came in this morning right at the key point where we were, people were questioning about why just England, why not wider? Um, and I think in case the message hasn't sort of come across it really is to do with you know when we're trying to set something new up streamlining it and trying to reduce some of the, the variation that we get across different countries and so if we can get it right in England then we can think about expanding to other countries and you know a lot of our studies in our group at Imperial do include England Scotland Wales um, but we're just because we're starting small with this pilot study we're just starting in England um, and then even with CAP3 we're not going to all sites we're just going to four of the sort of larger sites that are involved in CAP3 that have really research intensive um, universities associated with them and investigators that were, were really interested in, in working with us for this. And so the participating sites are Birmingham, Newcastle, London Northwest, which is, includes St Mark's and Manchester University. So these are our four hospital trusts that are involved in this pilot Lynch registry. And so what data are we going to collect? So we're going to approach these people because they have said as part of CAP3 that they are interested in taking part in research. So that allows us through John to contact them and say, we're, doing, we're creating this registry that we, we would like to use for future research projects. And so we would want to contact you in the future. Um, and so we, with that, we get consent and then we are able to access those patients' medical records. And the information that we want from those medical records are things like attendance at colonoscopy, have you been offered, how often have you been, you know, what, what was your experience, et cetera, what was found, and then of course your Lynch relevant um, information, so your mismatch repair gene variant. 
So in addition to that standard medical information that's being collected anyway, we wanted to administer a questionnaire to assess some of the things that we're particularly interested in and we think that we're going to be interested in in the future. And that's collecting some information on basic dem demographics so that we can try and look at various research, research questions by things like age, ethnicity and sex. And then we also wanted to go into a bit more detail about some of the medical history. So have you got a history of bowel cancer? Because my group in particular is really focused on gastrointestinal cancers. Um, and then also asking about aspirin and things like inflammatory bowel disease. So that's our starting point um, when we're recruiting people into this pilot registry. We're, this is the information we're collecting. Now, obviously, to get this right, it was really, really important to include a lot of patient and public involvement and engagement. Um, so with the help of our Twitter account, but mainly Bowel Cancer UK and Lynch Syndrome UK, we reached out to say that we really needed some help designing this to make sure that we're addressing the questions that are important to Lynch Syndrome patients. Um, and in our panel of PPI representatives, it was really important that we had a range of people in age, in terms of background, communities, personal experiences, skills, and as well as where people that have been involved in research before and people that haven't, because some people become sort of professional uh, patients involved in research and they perhaps don't see the same things that somebody that's never been involved in research would see. So we put together a panel of eight reps um, that really helped us design how we would go about designing uh, and, and the questionnaires that we were going to administer in this registry. And so just to illustrate here um, that we want, or we have planned and continue to try and implement patients being involved in all aspects of the research cycle in the research that we're doing. And the things in green are things that have already been done and the patient uh, reps have been involved in. So that's looking at the, the database and how we plan to collect the data in the pilot registry, um, developing the study materials, so what the consent form looks like, what the patient information form looks like. And then we had two patient reps actually read the study protocol to make sure again that they thought that what we were doing was important to people that this um, Lynch syndrome affects. Um, and then as we go on, they'll be involved in interpreting the data that we collect and any research findings. And then we have one patient rep that's part of our steering committee that uh, meets all the time to discuss what we're going to do with the data. So as I said, we've had um, three workshops already um, focusing on recruitment strategies. So how do we, how do we um, approach the patients? Um, the materials, as I said, also the website content, because obviously it's important that we have uh, a, a place where people can go to find out more information. Um, and then again, the study protocol, as I, as I mentioned. I meant to say when I started, I was going to go through this really fast because I know we're behind time. And if anyone thought I was going too fast, they should put their hand up. And I forgot to say it. So <laughs> if, if I am going too fast, do put your hand up. And I've got the attention span of a gnat, so I'll wonder why you've put your hand up. <laughs> um, so recruitment thus far. So in the four centres, um, so we've got 24 people from St Mark's of a total of about 78, I think it is, um, in CAP th uh, 3. And then we've got the same number, which is rather suspicious to me, but um, <laughs> same number from Birmingham and Manchester. Um, and ironically, the hub of CAP 3, oops, zero. <laughs> um, but no, it's... It, I, it's uh, don't want to make a thing of this because we've only just started recruiting and it's just taking a little bit longer. Um, and coming from Imperial, I can't complain about how long things take because Imperial is... We're still reading. <laughs> <laughs> it's stuck in R&D, It's stuck in R&D, well, but it well, is moving. I with the chairman about that. That's why I put it up there. I thought if I... Um, and so, so that's a really quick explanation of this, um, how we're forming this registry of consented patients that allows us to contact them in the future about specific research projects. And so it's different from a national registry. And years, you've been working on this for a long time. And the original plan was to have this all bells and whistles national registry. And we'd have everything. We'd have everyone and everything and consent on everyone. And it would be a lovely Cinderella story. And it just proved to be a little bit more difficult than um, we anticipated. And so at the moment, we have this national project that's going on that's not we're not able to approach people uh, about new research projects at the moment, but it does have national data, so that's great. It's, that's the advantage of that, that we know really everything that's on a po in the national scale, 
but this pilot registry is consented and allows us to do specific research projects that we can approach people about. So I hope that's clear. Yeah. Um, so just to give you an example of what we could do with this registry, or what we plan to do immediately and, and some things in the future. So it allows us to ask questions such as how many people have had a cancer diagnosis in these, in these people? How many are taking aspirin and how frequently? What dose? How many people have been tested for H. pylori, for example? How many people have been offered colonoscopy, having colonoscopy, and what factors are associated with the patients having colonoscopy? Um, and this, the three questions on the right here uh, make up one of the projects in my PhD student's um, PhD. And so I'm now just going to present her questions, and this is her here, Emma Robbins. Um, and so she's really driven, driven this, um, and it's based on this information that you already know, that you're at, with Lynch syndrome, you're advised to have regular colonoscopy surveillance um, and usually advised every 18 months to two years. But we know that there are man many challenges, some related to the patient, some related to the way the invites are done. And um, you, know, you may not have been invited for, for surveillance, but we wanted to understand what are those challenges for people having colonoscopy. So how can we help improve the re regularity so that people are able to adhere to that two year interval for checkup um, and what their, the patient experience is and how we can improve that experience to make sure that people do go and get it because it's so important. And so as I said earlier, the, the blue box is the people that are included in the pilot registry to begin with. So that's our pool of people that we can approach for Emma's study. And then Emma is going to exclude people who are less than 25 years old because you wouldn't have been invited for surveillance colonoscopy until you're 25. Um, and then those that have had surgery to remove the rectum. So she's, she's going to approach a subset of people in the registry. And so as I mentioned earlier, we'll have the medical records and the baseline questionnaire that we'll have administered to everyone anyway. And then for Emma's study, she's designing a specific questionnaire to address her research questions. And that is trying to understand the, the barriers to having colonoscopy in patients with Lynch syndrome. And so that's looking at their socioeconomic characteristics, how they feel about colonoscopy, uh, uh, and what they see as important barriers and facilitators to having colonoscopy. And so again, to do this, um, to develop this questionnaire, we wanted to involve patients, of course. And so we started this multi-step process by uh, reviewing the literature um, to see what was already out there. And then Emma um, convened a workshop of six patient um, or people living with Lynch syndrome um, to discuss the views and experiences um, and to identify the challenges that those people with Lynch syndrome had with colonoscopy. And so just very quickly, um, that workshop was really uh, productive. And Emma found that they, she could group the main challenges into five headings. And that is the coordination of care, booking the appointments, attending the appointments, views and experiences of colonoscopy and bowel prep, and information and support. And just to give you a little bit of information about what things came under each of these headings. So the coordination of care is about having a dedicated healthcare team that looks after the patient, um, continuity uh, and good communication. Things that can affect patients' uh, ability to book appointments, of course, is the, is the time and effort involved. That having an online portal, who to contact, often people, you know, it's often confusing who you should contact. Um, having flexibility um, and the notice that you get for the appointment. And then things are like attending appointments, you know, it's really important to have an appointment that allows you to not have to take time off work. You know, can people always get to the hospital? It's not always the case that people find it easy to get to the hospital and, or have somebody that can take them home from the hospital. Um, so again, it's important to think about these things and how we can try and improve them. And then of course, the big one for a lot of people is the bowel prep, um, the fear, dislike, worry of having that bowel prep, you know, and again, getting to the hospital having had the bowel prep. Um, and, you know, people that have had previous bad experiences, you know, they might just have one bad experience and say, that's it, I'm never going again. But there might be something about that experience that we can actually do something about. And of course, the fear of bad news. Nobody wants bad news, but it's helping the patients understand that, you know, if things are detected early, they're much more treatable. 
And then finally, information and support. You know, I think some of the challenges that people see are that they don't get enough information. Um, sometimes communication with other people with Lynch syndrome can really help, um, and also communication with the healthcare providers. So these are the challenges that the, the patient workshop identified that were most important for colonoscopy checkup. So it was um, uh, about these factors that we built the questionnaire that we're going to administer to the people in the pilot study. So using this information, Emma's currently drafting the questionnaire and it actually is about to go out in May for a pretest. Um, so brace yourself, Jill, I think it's coming your way. Um, and also um, you know, other people involved in the study. Um, and then the view is that this questionnaire will get sent to the people um, in Emma's study in October and we'll have data hopefully for this meeting next year. So final slide. This is where we're left. We're frantically gathering the data. We then we've got to analyze the data and then we're going to have another patient workshop where we discuss the study results, uh, what it all means and, and then develop a plan for sharing um, and, and, and you know, get that information out there so that people can try and help improve um, uh, surveillance for Lynch syndrome patients. I hope that wasn't too quick. Uh, my final slide is acknowledgements because this stuff takes a village and I think I've been, I, 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 this is my only sort of Lynch syndrome work, you know, I do a lot of stuff in, in GI cancers in, in other areas, but I have to say the amount of um, enthusiasm for helping with this work is phenomenal and from the academic people at the, at the different universities to the patient reps, you know, people have really thrown their time and effort into this and the amount of information and helpful feedback that we've got from everyone, I think um, hopefully is going to make this work really important and interesting. So this is Paul Graliak, who is the clinical trial manager in my group and he's been very much in charge of keeping this on its legs and Emma, as I said, PhD uh, focused on this work. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions.